Okay, so conversations about gender and autism always start with the gender ratio in autism. Yeah? And that's what I'm going to do here, because I think we can learn some useful things uh, from that. So we know that males are more vulnerable to developing autism, or more likely to develop autism, than are females. Uh, but what is the precise male-to-female ratio in autism? Um, well, a student of mine looked into that. She did a meta-analysis looking at epidemiological studies where people had gone out into the community and attempted to ascertain all cases uh, of uh, autism. Uh, and she looked in those studies at the male-to-female ratio, and she synthesized that doing a meta-analysis, doing a kind of pooling of all of their results. So rather impressively, uh, this is bigger than my usual sort of sample size. She had a sample of 14 million uh, people uh, in this analysis from 54 studies. And the answer is... 4.2, okay? That was the overall male-to-female ratio, 4.2 in those studies, uh, males for every female diagnosed of autism. And that's the figure that you'll find in DSM-5, for example, 4 to 1. That's the sort of consensus that people talk about. Now, what was interesting about these papers, these studies that she analysed, was that there was tremendous variability between them. So some studies came back and said, well, there's eight males to every female in our sample, and others said, oh, there's two males to every female in our sample. So we decided to try and study that variability in order to understand a bit better what the true male-to-female ratio is in autism. And I want to tell you about one particular way in which we studied that. And that was by comparing two types of epidemiological study. So we looked at studies that we branded as having passive case ascertainment. So this is a study where you want to find out how many people in a given community have autism. And you go out into that community and you look for everybody who has a pre-existing autism diagnosis, who's already been picked up and diagnosed by clinical services. Yeah. And the, the male-to-female ratio in those studies was 4.6 to 1. Yeah. And then we contrasted that with active case ascertainment studies. So these are studies where you go out into the community, again, you're trying to find what proportion of people have autism. But here, you design your study so that you can pick up cases even if they're not already diagnosed. Yep. So maybe you screen the population and then people who score above a certain point on your screener, uh, you give them an assessment. And intriguingly, in these studies, we found a lower male-to-female ratio, three to one. Yep. And in fact, in both, so in both in relative and in absolute terms, these studies essentially found more females. So what does that tell us? To me, that tells us that there are females out there who, um, if you assess them and give them a proper autism assessment, they will score up according to current, current conventional diagnostic criteria. Uh, but for some reason, they're not getting diagnosed. They're not making it into autism clinics. And that's the contrast between the 4.6 to the 3 to 1. That gap uh, is, is kind of explained by the fact that the, that some, that the active case ascertainment studies went out and found undiagnosed cases, and as a result, they ended up boosting the number of females that they identified, both in relative and absolute terms. So there we have evidence, firstly, of a bias against females receiving a, a diagnosis of autism, and secondly, evidence that the true male-to-female ratio of autism, as it's currently conceptualised, as it's currently assessed, is not 4 to 1, as DSM-5 would, would say, but it's actually nearer 3 to 1. Yeah? So um, whenever I talk to people I, I, you know, who run clinics, I, I say to them, you know, what's the male-to-female ratio in your clinic? And it's pretty rare that it's 3 to 1. It's normally higher than that. And so my sense is that we still have this widespread issue whereby there are girls out there in the community who, who if they were assessed, would score up, but who aren't making it into these services. Now, let's think about another male-to-female ratio. Do you remember before I was saying that autism can be conceptualised as a dimensional condition, representing people who score very, very highly on measures of autistic traits, on measures of social communication, social reciprocity, and flexibility, dimensional measures. Well, what happens if you define autism not by who meets DSM-5 criteria or DSM-4 criteria, but instead on who scores very high on autism trait measures? Yeah? Who's right, sitting right at the extreme high end of that distribution? 
Well, what's interesting is if you look at those people who are scoring right up the top of the distribution with really high levels of social communication, social reciprocity difficulties, uh, tendency towards inflexibility, high sensory rates of sensory difficulties, you tend to find that the gender ratio narrows further and that you will find two to one, two males to each female. So that's kind of interesting to contrast that to the three to one. So you've got three to one of people who, if you assess them, uh, they will meet criteria, but you also seem to have this set of people who have very high levels of autistic traits and yet are not quite meeting diagnostic criteria, and females are disproportionately likely to be in that position. The, 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 the contrast of that two-to-one and the three-to-one, you know, uh, my interpretation of it, and I do acknowledge it's not the only interpretation of it, but my interpretation of it is that there are females out there with high levels of autistic traits, but even if you give them a gold standard assessment, they're less likely than equivalent males to uh, receive an autism diagnosis. And that is, um, there is evidence to support that. So Ginny Russell, uh, in her work, found that higher traits were required by females to receive an autism diagnosis. So you had to be almost further up that trait distribution to kind of tip you over into meeting uh, diagnostic criteria. And um, Dworzynski and Frankie Happe and that group, again, uh, showed that if they looked at high autistic trait females and males, uh, the females were less likely to meet uh, full diagnostic criteria for autism, but the ones that did tended to have high levels of behavioural or cognitive difficulty. So it's almost like they needed some sort of extra types of difficulty to kind of push them over again into receiving that official formal diagnosis. So when I think, based on what I've been talking about so far, when I think about the under of females of autism... <coughs> You know, to me, that strikes me as, as an important problem. You know, my sense is, I'm sure, that there must be uh, girls and women out there who uh, essentially are autistic, you know, who have very high levels of autistic traits, would maybe meet diagnostic criteria of their assessed, but who are doing fine and don't need a diagnosis. You know, I'm sure there are people out there in, in that position, but I'm also sure that there are many, many girls and women out there who are undiagnosed, uh, who are essentially autistic and are not receiving the understanding and the support that they could get because their difficulties haven't been properly understood and recognised. So I see the under of females of autism uh, or autistic females as you know, a, a crucial problem for us to try and uh, grapple with. In order for us to, to grapple with it and to try and address it, we need to understand it. And based on what I've said so far, I'd break it down into reflecting two types of bias. Um, you know, if you think about the four to one versus the three to one gender ratio, I think there's clearly a bias against um, females with suspected autism actually receiving a proper autism assessment. That's one part of this problem. There is also potentially another part of this problem, and this is, a, as I'll say, this is a trickier one to solve because it's conceptually very, very tricky. Um, but there's a group, uh, there's, a, there's another bias where there are some females who have high levels of autistic traits, high levels of difficulties that are likely impacting upon their, their functioning, their well-being, and yet they're not meeting diagnostic criteria. Yep. So that's the second element uh, of this bias. People have become increasingly aware of this problem. Uh, people have tried to, um, are taking steps to try and address it. And the, there's one particular strategy that pretty much everybody is currently pursuing. And this is to say, well, maybe there's an under of autistic females because there's a female typical presentation of autism, which I call the female autism phenotype, which doesn't fit as well, our current diagnostic criteria, which after all, were largely derived from and then validated on male cases. Yep. So people have essentially said, okay, if we're going to understand this ascertainment bias against females, we need to understand the individual characteristics of autistic females. We need to understand the female autism phenotype. Um, and this is uh, from uh, Tanya Marshall. Uh, this, she has all these great pictures sort of expressing the female autism phenotype. And interestingly, um, this is not just some sort of crackpot idea that I'm, that I'm putting to you here. It, it's very much entering uh, the, the mainstream of autism research to the extent that it's even reflected in, in the great uh, the Bible, uh, a DSM-5, uh, you know, where there's an acknowledgement uh, that there's an under of females um, and that that might be because there's something, if you like, kind of distinct about the female presentation 
uh, of autism. And it's that that I'd like to now go on uh, and talk about and share with you uh, some ideas of mine and with colleagues and, and based on, uh, of course, on other people's research as well about the nature of the, um, of the female autism uh, phenotype. And I want to just give a little sort of warning here or a, a sort of qualification, I suppose, which is I do try not to fall into the trap of making kind of unhelpful and crass generalizations like all autistic women are like this, all autistic men are like that. You know, I don't want to go down a kind of men are from Mars, women are from Venus sort of route here. Um, what I'm talking about are tendencies. You know, I'm talking about averages, tendencies for females to be more likely to be like this, tendencies for males to be more like that, likely like that. Um, and of course, you know, we'll, we'll know males who show characteristics of the so-called female autism phenotype, and we'll know autistic females who um, have a kind of, you know, much more classical kind of male typical presentation. But I'm, so just bear in mind that I'm talking about averages here. And then the other point I want to make is that, you know, what's clear about this field that we're all here to talk about today is that autistic people, in particular um, autistic women, and clinicians were very much ahead of the researchers on this. So, you know, you'll find you know, really interesting papers from the 80s with clinicians putting forward views about there being a female autism phenotype. You'll read plenty of memoirs or go to talks by autistic women where they very articulately explain the autism, uh, phenot uh, female autism phenotype. Now, that's really important, uh, but my view is that before we start taking the sort of valuable ideas that are generated from that sort of anecdote, uh, they need to be tested out in more empirical scientific studies. So what I've tried to do here is to focus on those areas of the female phenotype that are not only reflecting the experiences of some autistic women and the clinical experience of people, but also where there's some sort of solid uh, empirical scientific basis for, for, for believing these, these autism uh, gender differences.